everyone, and welcome to another episode of Speaking to Our musical expert, Edward Pichardo, Esquire, and Royce Russell, Esquire. We're glad that you're here with us today. Thank you for tuning in every week at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday. And for sharing it out, for catching the replay, and letting us know that the content has been helpful as you figure out what's going on in this world around us. So with that being said, let me let our co-host welcome you today. Como esta, señor Picaro? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hola, mi gente. Como esta? Muy esta buena tarde. Hope all is well. Um, as usual, I believe that the content that you're going to receive on this show is going to be quite fulfilling, educational, as well as spiritually fulfilling. So um, definitely stay tuned. We got some good information for you. Awesome. And Mr. Russell, welcome and great to have you on board today. I know you're thank not in you. the field. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm actually on the ground, right? So thank you for having me today. You know, it's always nice to come back to your own show. You know what I mean? You know, I'm saying so, so the seat is warm, you know, I mean, it's still you're still there. Thank you. Uh, hopefully everybody will find uh, the information useful because we want to give you the use, useful information so you can empower yourself or empower others. So uh, let's get on with what we get on with. Absolutely. So we spoke about this. Uh, we've been leading up to following what's happening with Governor Hochul and this bail reform. It's been a hot topic with what we've been watching transpire, especially here in New York. And we know, as we always say, the country watches um, what we actually are able to do in other places when they see how laws are created and what actually comes to fruition here. So uh, we're going to talk about what is happening with Governor Hochul. And uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. So before I bring up the article, let's just give everyone some background. Uh, well, uh, the background basically is, is that with the, you know, with the basic uh, reported uh, rise in crime uh, throughout New York City. Um, there have been a number of individuals, different quarters, uh, populations, groups who are calling for a reform of the uh, law that was passed in the legislature sometime within the last, I believe, last year, the year before, which was referred to as bail reform. And so they want to reform those laws because those laws are being perceived as being easy on, you know, the accused, allowing people to get out and 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 commit new crimes. And so that's what's contributing to the wave. And so we have to empower judges to be able to not have their hands cuffed, so, so to say, no pun intended, and to be allowed to uh, set bail uh, where it's necessary to quote unquote, protect the uh, community. You know, basically what you have here is, is that the bail reform that took place is basically being held responsible by many for the rise in crime. I don't believe, I certainly am not one that um, uh, uh, agrees with that argument. I don't think my colleague Royce Russell does either. Um, so uh, what we're talking about here today is basically is, is the package of legislation that is now part of the budget conversation and that is what reportedly is holding up the passage of the budget which was supposed to take place on april 1st that and i believe some funding for a new stadium for the buffalo bills up um near buffalo but those two items are something that came up late in the negotiations and now it's causing both uh, houses to have to negotiate with the governor to pass a budget that includes uh, those items. And what we have here today is, you know, we talked about this on the previous show, but we didn't have the actual language. And today we actually do have the language. We've kind of reviewed it and we're going to do some commentary on it. I'll let you take over from there, Royce, and I'll you know, come in back and forth on, on some of these items. Well, I think one of the, I think one of the things that we talked about off air and that we're going to talk about right now, since you say uh, we're given a little history. What is the history? The history is this, is that we have someone who is the interim governor who wants to actually become full time governor. 
That is history. That's important to what's at play. And we have first time Maya who's looking at what's at play. Can they walk hand in hand when we had years of the governor and the mayor of New York City not walking in hand to hand? That's history. That kind of sets the table for what we're seeing and how things are being portrayed. I'm always about the critical thinking, critical analysis and how things are being brought forward. So this need to walk hand in hand um, is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, it, it is happening now because the mayor, who's former NYPD, sees the crime. I'm not going to say your eyes are not fooling you. Sees the uptick in crime, wants to do something about it, knows that there's a cultural tie for him being in office and what he's going to bring to a certain community, brown and black community, and what bail reform and police reform means to that community and how do you negotiate that and how do you navigate that you can take the lead which he has to a certain degree and then you can call upon the governor to take the real lead and say this is what we're going to do what is interesting when we talk about bail reform in the context for which we're talking about it I haven't really seen any articles, and maybe you have Dr. Grant or maybe you have Brother Ed, seen any articles that really substantiate bail reform, recidivism, uptick in crime. What I've seen is uptick in crime, we're going to look at bail reform, and that's the reason, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen the numbers. I haven't seen the fact by fact, well, this guy was released 20 times. And look what happened. Now, I've seen spotty instances of that really dealing with those that have mental issues, right? Those that have mental issues and were arrested for trespassing, arrested for, for uh, theft of services, hopping the train, and then they do something outlandish, some crime that is like unforgivable, pushing someone on the railroad tracks. And you see that this person has been arrested numerous times or stabbing someone or hitting someone with a hammer and they've been arrested numerous times and released back into the street because the crimes that they committed was very minor. What I haven't seen is the violence that we see in the street by gunplay related to someone that's been released numerous times for having a gun. So, and, 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 and I think that's the that's the issue here. The problem is, is that that's the smoke and, and mirrors. That's the smoke and mirrors that's here. Yeah, you, you don't you don't have a scientific correlation between the the passage of these laws and the uptick in crime. You don't right. have that extensive evaluation of each case and being able to then say, okay, this individual right here was out on the street and committed this crime because of these new laws. These new laws allowed for this, this, and that. What you have in many cases, actually, is quite the contrary. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I've been saying. I mean, you, yeah. don't have, you don't have the correlation. So so back to the history and what you're saying. So this, I think, is another way for those who are anti-bail reform to capture the moment, right? And then use that moment to go to an issue that they were against from the beginning. Right, because if there was the scientific numbers like we see, or we were requesting, or we want, that would be a six-page story in every media outlet. So, well, well, well let's, like let's, we, let's 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 make no pause. mistake about. Okay, oh, hold on. Before we even get to that, why don't we have that data for the average person listening and hearing what you're saying? Why don't we explain well, why we don't have that's, it? That's why when when Ed said that's the issue. I jumped in and said, no, that's the smoke and mirrors, because that's the smoke and mirrors that we're going to take this issue that we have over here and we're going to lay the blanket down to cover this big hole. When you know that the blanket is not going to do anything for the pothole, you need more gravel and more tar to do to deal with that pothole. And, and so you're not going to see it because it's not there. No one's done the study. Now, now, my, my, my perspective is, well, listen, the bottom line is, is that a lot of this has to do with tides and, 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 and what the public perception is. And that's where the politics come in, unfortunately, because 
about at the time that the current bail reform law was passed, there was a progressive wave. Folks were really uh, 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 taking in the mindset that we had to uh, be uh, more reasonable in ter- and more um, equitable in terms of bail and individuals that are accused and their ability to be out uh, while their cases are pending. And so there was this progressive mindset, and that's what allowed the governor at the time, Governor Cuomo, uh, to work with the legislature to pass the, that reform. And, and so, you know, it was a time of, you know, celebration and, you know, people were looking at what happened in the Khalif Browder case and other cases and and, and people, you know, languishing. And, and even with uh, uh, talking, Governor... We're less than a five-year window. Yeah, and, and even... Understand. And even with Governor Hockle, when she recently passed the less is more. But then what happens? Now you have this situation where people are up in arms saying, you know, crime is out of control. We need to do something. We need to, you know, uh, come down on these folks. They think this is a game. They're, They're getting arrested and they're back out the next day. And that's the basic perception. No, no scientists studies no 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 analysis. facts no facts no, no, facts. no not no even facts. any fact it's no just facts. a matter no and, and look and look listen i don't want to i don't want to understate i don't want to say uh minimize what is happening to certain people okay they are people being victimized they are crimes being committed no question but you can't just look at the what's happening these incidents and all of a sudden say oh well it's because of this or it's because of that because you're actually doing an injustice to the situation because until we do a forensic scientific analysis of why we aren't going to really be able to solve the problem i mean listen it's there have been times when you know the, the the police have gotten everything that they wanted Judges have had all of this power. People getting locked, and the crime is still. Wait, 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 wait. wait. When yeah. you say there has been times, the times have never left. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, bail, that's what, I, I, what, what I'm reform, trying to say. Bail reform was was the bail reform was a gateway to make sure that those that are stuck in poverty are not punished unfairly, unequal to those who have the economic means. To live another day, restate it in this fashion. No, no, I no, have no, a no, job no. that I need to be at every single day, and they aren't any benefits. And if I miss a day of work, then my whole life is turned upside down because I live paycheck by paycheck, right? I have an unreasonable landlord. I have, you know, I'm a single parent. So if you keep me in jail because I jumped the turnstile, you keep me in jail because I was smoking marijuana. You set bail because I had four other instances of smoking marijuana over a period of three or four years or two or three years. And you set bail, even though you think that bail is low, $750, $500. There were people in the black and brown community that could not make that bail. So bail reform sought to put things on an equal ground from the lowest to the highest Let's be more humanistic. Let's look at the needs and treatments that people need in order to rebound, become self-sufficient because if they're locked away, they lose their apartment. They lose their apartment, they're homeless. If they're homeless, they lose services because nobody can contact them to give them services, Medicaid, Medicare, health benefits, WIC, you name it. So the platform for bail reform was different than the platform that they're using here now to say that it should be changed. And that's why a guy like me, a guy like you, a doctor like Dr. Grant is saying, give me some correlations and then maybe I can ride with you or not ride with you. And, 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 and that's my, and that's my, and that's my specific point. My point is, is that when you don't do the analysis, when you don't do the scientific study, you're doing an injustice to the community. Because you're not really searching for solutions. What you're searching for is convenient 
slogans. You're searching. You're it's like you're, you're searching just for another term. Me. You're searching for another term. Yeah, that's you're, you're just for. yeah. You, all you're doing is coming up with something that's gonna placate folks for now, but not really deal with the with the actual issues. Because what you said, okay, this person is incarcerated. They lose their job. They lose their home. What happens to their children? What happens to their Domino family effect. members? Right. You know right. how does how does that contribute to the uptick in crime? Right. Because now you have an angry well, once, young once, person. Once again, once again yeah. and to your point, right, when it comes down to policing, right, they say, oh, don't take the small amount and disparage the whole group, right? So let's look at bail reform. So, so There's the amount of people here that this affects, and you know what we're talking about, and the politicians know what we're talking about, and I just recited what we're talking about. So let's don't throw all that away to talk about the few, which you haven't articulated or show me, whoever is making the decisions that that even there's even a correlation to it. Now we know that there's too much guns on the street, and we know that there's gunplay. But when the people are caught with those guns and are doing the shooting, I don't see. I haven't read any article saying this guy shot another guy, and the judge saw him, and he's walking free. Let's get some of those articles. If those articles are not there, and their bail is being set, and they happen to make bail and they're out on bail and they commit another crime, then it's not bail reform or lack thereof. The judge did what the judge did. And there's nothing in the bail reform package that ties the judge to not do that. And, 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 and just to, there's nothing. And, and just to be clear, so um, the, the this new proposed package of reforms, one of the major changes that they're looking to make is they're including a whole new subsection to um, uh, CPL section 510.10, which is kind of the, the, the law that talks about, you know, um, that, that, you know, uh, uh, doing a uh, release on own recognizance and, and, or uh, setting bail, right. And setting conditions of bail. And they're looking like, like, for instance, it begins by talking about murder being included as one of the qualifying offenses for no bail, right? Or for rather for bail versus release. This is the smoke and mirrors. When wasn't murder ever? And, and that's what I was about murder. to say. And that's what I was about to say. Because in the current law, in uh, subsection uh, four, um, J, it already says any crime that is alleged to have caused the death of another person. That sounds like murder to me. Yeah, you can't make it any <laughs> simpler than that here. And this is part of the politics and the sensationalism. They talk about murder in this. They talk about murder in the first degree, and they define and as defined in section one twenty five point seven. I mean, you know, they they fill up. You know they they use it's all the, these it's words the template plan, mm -hmm. and, and they and they and they and they quote each and every section that's connected. There's no judge that's allowing a guy to walk with no bail who committed murder. It, 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 exactly, it, it, exactly. And and then they talk about a and they say uh, uh, to reasonably assure the safety of another person or persons in the community upon a finding of one or more of the following, a violation of an order of protection issued by any court. Well, there's already in the current law uh, a language concerning contempt and contempt of court. There's no hey, 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 And let me, stop, let me stop you right there, right, before you continue, right? And I just want to let everyone know, this is where you have to do your homework. Like, if you don't know that stuff already exists, you think something new is happening. When... It's nothing new. It's like going to the dealership to get your tires changed and the mechanic just rotates the four tires that you have already and tells you that it's changed. <laughs> it's like, yo, what's up? The magic. I watched what you did. You just took the back tires and put them in the front and took the front tires and put them in the back. Like you're not slick. These things already exist. As Ed, as you were saying, recouched, redefined, using the same language, it already exists. Now, what might be a delicate dance when it comes down to bail reform, if you really want to talk about issues and really deal with what's going on, might be the scenario where there's an order of protection. 
in a domestic violence situation where someone violates the order of protection and they keep on violating the order of protection and the judge does not set bail. Now you're teetering on some issues where you can have a real concrete discussion about bail reform. Does it work? Does it not work? Should we set some bail? Because you know that when you violate an order of protection, it's about emotions, less about disrespecting the court, less about that because a lot of people don't even believe that violating an order of protection is a contract, not between you and the person you're supposed to stay away from, but a contract between you and the court. The court is telling you to do something. And that's why I'm saying that 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 under the current law, there's already a qualifying offense for criminal contempt in the second right. degree, in the first degree. I mean, I mean, and, and there's also bail jumping in the as a qualifying offense for the setting of bail already in the current law. Not just that, you also have as a qualifier a crime involving witness intimidation, right? Now, no, you also and, and, have a crime involving witness tampering. Now, when we, say qualifier, the current law. when we say qualifier, what we're saying is that that makes you eligible for a judge to set bail. So you just yeah. so make sure folks know that's a qualifier. So yeah. if you violate order protection, you're eligible for bail. If you tamper and, with a witness, you're eligible for bail. I mean, in that bail will be set, right? And, and, and that's what we mean no because, because what the law said was what the what the what the pre what the what the, what the current reform, because these proposals that you're seeing right here aren't law yet. There, there's there's apparently mm -hmm. negotiations taking place right now as we speak, you know, but and speaking, and speaking of speak I, before you go on, I tell everybody now and I told everybody before the, and you said it Ed, before the first step is speaking it out. Next step, it gets written out. Next step, it gets discussed about. Next step is all about you get what I'm saying. So right now we went from speaking to writing. Now we're discussing. And it's about to be about. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you have, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line here, I think that we're trying to make is, is that you have, you know, you have already a lot of protection in the current law. A lot of this is really smoke and mirrors. And some of it is dangerous smoke and mirrors to be quite frank. Because because see, the, the, the bottom line here that folks have to understand is, is that if you're charged with a crime, there's a presumption of innocence here, okay? I'm not guilty just because I'm charged. There's probable cause, okay, fine. There's probable cause to believe I committed, but that doesn't mean that I committed this crime. So I should be allowed to fight this case, and the important issue should be me returning to court and not committing any new offenses, okay? The idea of incarcerating somebody simply because they are charged with a crime is is, is 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 something that you have to think about okay do you want to live in a country where a simple charge turns into an immediate conviction simply because you're charged because let's face it if i'm charged and i'm sitting in jail you're basically saying i'm guilty okay if i can't get out and you're really and most, people, and most people will plead guilty in order to get out. Exactly. And if if on top of that, I can't get out because I can't afford because I don't have the money because I'm not from one of the landed families because I'm not from a particular class, then that's certainly unequal and an injustice. Mm -hmm. And and I think I think one of the things that I want to I want to quote from is Senate Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins, who says, quote, in his article, we have come to a point now where whatever happens, parentheses, there are people who want to exploit the fact that we do not want to incarcerate people because they are poor. We do not want to incarcerate people because they are poor. And she said it earlier this week in, in response to people wrongfully taking bail reform and trying to use it to say this is why we have an increase in crime. The reason why we have an increase in crime is varied. And one of them has to do with not taking this money and building a Buffalo stadium and maybe putting it into some type of projects and community well-being and jobs and things of that nature rather than building a new stadium. And so it is very dangerous. And if we don't keep our eyes on it, we're going to miss it 
again and and it's always this dance dr grant and ed it's always this dance two steps forwards three steps back right so you were talking about it you were talking about it from the terms of progressive right so the progressives call them what you may whatever label we took two steps forward in the scheme of humanity now we want to take three steps back in that same same vehicle and what is also dangerous before you go on your next point was also dangerous is that it mentioned things that are already within the law now as you stated but you get somebody that's a police officer you get somebody who now thinks that they're empowered and now they go on to do the thing that is unimaginable unimaginable such as crimes when you used to receive a dat a desk appearance ticket in new york that means you ju you jump the train style you smoke a marijuana here it is here go a summons come back to court another day with the language that they're using in the reform in the reform of the reform trying to highlight something that shouldn't even be touched it empowers police to then say you know what you received the dat last week or three weeks ago or in, with, with the way the statute reads within the past 18 months up to two years you received this desk appearance ticket desk appearance ticket and you know what in my discretion i'm not giving it to you now now you're going to spend a day in jail which means mm -hmm. that you might lose your job rather than giving me the ticket i come back for my day in court no one has said that there's been a correlation from giving somebody a, a desk appearance ticket what they call a dat and them not failing them failing to show up in court you show me that you show me that hey every time we give out these tickets people don't show up to court then you want to do some bail i'm with you then if you want to do incarceration overnight to make sure to show show up in court i'm with you but without that study without those articles without that articulation without those real facts what are we talking about and i just want to point something out for some folks that may have any lingering doubts of what we're talking about the current law 510.10 .10, right under subsection four um four f right no no t i mean t says a qualifying offense right for bail any felony or class a misdemeanor involving harm to an identifiable person or property where such charge arose from conduct occurring while the defendant was released on his or her own recognizance or released under conditions for a separate felony or class A misdemeanor involving harm to an identifiable person or property. Provided, however, that the prosecutor must show reasonable cause to believe that the defendant committed the instant crime and any underlying crime. Okay? Now, now you... You that's already in the current law. That's already in the current law. I mean, I mean, it's it's the correlation, the study that needs to be done is we need to look at whether or not the judges and the prosecutors are fully availing themselves of these of the current statute, whether the police are actually utilizing the law in terms of their discretion okay i got a feeling that that's not what's happening what's happening is is that when these bail reforms pass all of a sudden a certain segment of the criminal justice system said you know what this is this is this is too much this is too much and kind of said we're gonna just kind of let some of these things happen and let's see how people feel now and that's why I say this, this, you know, this is dangerous. This, this hoopla, this mindset that any time that, that we try to make things a little fairer for the small guy, all of a sudden it's a problem and it, and it needs a danger for the, uh, for the community. Um, um, it's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's disturbing when, you, so we, we really, without continuing to go through this law segment by segment, um, we ask folks to really do their homework and study Absolutely. When that some people are offering up in your name. Um, you know, one of the other things well, I did put here that, I, if I may, that I like to point out is one of the features here is reforms of the discovery statute. We talked about this months ago where, you know, prosecutors were saying that the discovery that they're being asked to hand over was really onerous. 
So now they're trying to basically obscure the language regarding the obligations of prosecutors to hand this information over by inserting some language stating material or information that is otherwise unavailable when it is not in the actual possession of the prosecutor, despite diligent and good faith efforts, reasonable under the circumstances. And so what they're basically saying that if it's not in their hands, let's say it's over there at the police department and they ask for it, then, you know, they don't have to really, you know, at this point, turn it over. And that's disturbing, right? Because I mean, we- it's disturbing. It's disturbing because of two things. One, everything is about implementation. Exactly. You have the best of laws out there in the world, but implementation determines whether or not a plan works or not. And so when you talk about discovery, and you talk about instead of the prosecution has to have to certify, certify that they handed over everything and the prosecution has to show the court that everything that they had and then some due diligence uh, in getting the documents over to the other side. When I look at the bail reform, reform of the bail reform and reform of the discovery, it is very one sided from a perspective of prosecution judges and doesn't really take the community into consideration so now we use the words substantially comply yeah. who determines what is substantial? substantial so the da determines what is substantial but yet i'm the one that may go to jail i'm the one that have to defend myself in this case so i don't get a chance to tell you what's substantial you may think a witness is not important I may think a witness is. So do you get a chance to withhold that information until the day before trial when I've been telling my attorney that, hey, look, there's someone else out there that knows what the deal is. I don't know their name, but I'm hearing this, that they're out there. So the plain words, the three card Monty, as I call it, you know, is, is a problem. It, it, it is a problem. And you need to speak to everybody, not just the prosecutors, not this, just the judges, to defense counsel, to the community. Well, I, I just wanted to, and I appreciate how you all are breaking down the law. You've seen the screen change a couple of times because in this article is a link to the confidential document. I don't know how the confidential document got leaked, but uh, <laughs> you can look at the links that I shared. So for those who are interested in reading a little bit more and understanding, this is where the legal meets the cultural. So our legal experts are breaking down what is actually listed in all of these proposed uh, changes. So uh, Joella, Richard, Kevin, thank you for tuning in live and being here and making sense of this because this affects black and brown communities the most here in New York when we're talking about what this bail reform could and should be. And then I always love to point out where there's an opportunity. When I asked before, who's tracking the data? Where's the information coming from? Some of the advocacy organizations and groups that have been very vocal in the closure of Rikers and looking at bail reform, there's an opportunity to create the data, to get the statistics, to do the follow-up and the study. So there is something that's tangible that supports any change or revisions. And we don't currently have those sorts of um, analytics to look at. So there's an opportunity for those who are really passionate and, and maybe in their second career or stage of life, if this is something that you want to be vocal about in community, there's a lane that needs to be filled. And, you know, for someone in business, you know, we solve problems. This is a problem. And so, and so, and so my mentor, I spoke to him earlier today and we joked about a saying that, um, it comes from the Caribbeans. I saw it came from the Bronx St. Mary's projects, but you know, I think everything comes from there, right? Because that's I'm just a Bronx kid, right? He said, he said to me, he said, This is where Jack gets his jacket. So I was like, This is where Jack gets his jacket. And he said, Yeah, man, this is where Jack gets his jacket. And I understood it without him explaining it. And I'm gonna use it today. You want to talk about profound protests? You want to talk about profound, uh, revolutionary, profound, get get your feet in the street. Be active instead of reactive. Be proactive, right? We know coming up, I think this this weekend, 
the Black Caucus is happening in Albany, mm-hmm. right? And we said we were going to discuss some of the conventions that are going on, but the Black Caucus is happening in Albany. It happens every year around about February sometime where it's cold. Now we got it in April. Maybe it'll be permanently in, in April, but it's happening. If there is a place where you want to get the attention of folks as to what's going on in your community and what you want to see happening, that's the place. That's where everybody is going to be. Assembly people, council people, you name it. They're going to be there. If you want to know what's going on, that's the place. The stuff that we're reading and talking about, that's what's going down. That's what's floating through the hallways. That's the conversation that people should be having. So profound protest brings you there if you need and request to put your feet in the street and you want change, right? And that's where, as my mentor said, Rick Jones, that's where Jack gets his jacket, right there. Don't be running around after it's already said and done. Oh my God, look what they passed. Oh, look what happened. You don't get a jacket then. You get Jack gets his jacket before it passes to say, I was in the struggle right then and there to try to prevent it. I may be won, I may be lost, but I was there. It didn't just happen to me. You just didn't come and just ask me what size those sneakers are and just take them from me. That is, that's not happening. And and just and 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 as and as um, Roy stated, um, it's you know it's it's really referred to as the Black and Puerto Rican Legislative Caucus. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have um, a lot of your um, African American, uh, Afro Caribbean, Latino legislators there this weekend. There'll be several seminars. Um, There'll be, you know, uh, celebratory events and, 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 and so forth. And a lot of your electeds are going to be there. And so um, it's a chance for you to speak to some of them about how you feel about some of these reforms. And I just wanted to point out real quick that not everything in this reform is bad. Let me just say, because one of the biggest things, and I said this previously, I think on a previous uh, segment that we had for this show was that. One of the things that I am in favor of, they're talking about increasing funding for pretrial diversion and employment programs to the tune of about eighty three point four million. Okay, Um, we also I'm looking over here in terms of raise the age implementation um, to 60 million of the 800 million that was uh, previously appropriated being used for that. Um, You also got involuntary commitment in Kendra's law you know, which has to do with somebody being mentally ill and the courts being able to commit that person. And one of the changes that they're looking at is taking into consideration self-neglect because right now the standard is danger to oneself with respect to that, danger to the community or danger to oneself. And that danger to oneself is a very high bar in many cases. You know, you could have somebody that's just really, really not taking care of themselves, but if you can't prove that they are a danger to themselves, That person ends up back on the street. And I think all of us who travel to out New York City see some really sad sights, especially me living here in Harlem. I I see some folks out here in the community that really do need to be in a hospital and really do need to be involuntarily committed and cared for. And, and, And it's sad, sad, sad to watch. And so I hope that that is actually passed, And you know, versus some of this other stuff, because as my colleague, once again, my, my co-host Royce pointed out earlier, a lot of the stuff that you see, like the more egregious incidents, are actually folks that are mentally ill and aren't getting the care that they need. You know, that's what, you know, in many cases, if, if you if we were to really sit down and break down these events, I would imagine that a high percentage of the more egregious stuff that we're seeing or crimes that we're seeing, incidents that we're seeing are being committed by people that actually really need help, that you know, it's a, who, who, go through, who go through, who go through the to. system, who go through the system, right, and are released or incarcerated for two days and released. That then you're building a case for let's look at this reform. But without that, you're not building a case. You just you just saying, hey, we'll get to you. Get to the back of the line. Don't worry. Soon come. Soon okay. come. No, nope. that's not what's happening. Well, like I said, this is um, important when we talk about where the legal meets the cultural because of how it affects us and without building that case. So I hope this 
helped those of you who didn't realize uh, what this actually means and how it will affect if they're if the changes aren't substantial. And if, if it is smoke and mirrors, there's some good, as you pointed out, uh, Attorney Pichardo, but we know that there's some for real cause and concern. So this is where the advocacy and the information is important to continue raising our voices and being at conferences like the Black and Latino um Black and Puerto Rican legislators um, conference that's happening this weekend. There's also National Action Network um, happening right now. And about being proactive. Yep, talk about being proactive. So, you know, there's a lot, and this is on the agenda as well. So, you know, I'll put that out there for folks who are interested in taking a look, but it's really important for us to utilize these platforms and these outlets to one, get the right information, and then to utilize that information by participating and getting engaged. So now let me um, just say one other thing in reference to the National Action Network, quick plug. Registration is free, right? And it's streaming live. So if you can't go, you can catch it on your computer. Get the information any which way you can. Absolutely. Any which way you can. So we just don't want to be here and not know what's happening in our own backyard and culturally. What's important, these laws, statutes, reforms, it all affects each and every one of us. So now let's get to a Supreme Court case um, that we want to follow up on. It, it continues, and I know folks might want to know what our legal experts have to say about the now infamous uh, slap that happened from a legal perspective, because there is now news of there might be some sanctions and some other things. So if we have time at the end of the show, we'll touch on that. But now on to what's happening with Supreme Court and uh, Mr. Larry Thompson. Yeah, well, this is well, well, Ed, let me set the table real quick in reference to you see malicious prosecution real quick before we dive into what we really what the case is about. Just from a definition standpoint, usually when you have a case of false arrest uh forced imprisonment forced detention usually the protocol is is that police will file charges against you and the charges and most of the time is disorderly conduct obstruction of governmental uh administration uh resisting arrest uh, something like those right and most likely those charges get dismissed either on your first court appearance either based upon the fact that the summons, the desk appearance ticket that we talked about, the summons is legally insufficient. That means there's not enough elements in there to meet the crime uh, legally, or the court looks at it and just says, we're dismissing this case by way of an adjournment, a contemplation of dismissal, or just look, judge, they, they, they wrote me a summons for a trespass. Here go my identification showing that I live at this location. I told them that they didn't want to hear it. Here I am, an arrest. I'm arrested. This this stuff happens every single day, just like in the case that Ed is going to articulate here with the Supreme Court, every single day. And so, therefore, the judge says the case is dismissed. And so, setting up what the Supreme Court had to deal with in those cases, when you talk about malicious prosecution and how you bring that forward, there was a standard that you had to meet in order to move forward with malicious prosecution. And that standard has been a very, very tight one, one that the plaintiff in the civil case for forced arrest, forced imprisonment, forced detention, i.e. the defendant in that same person in the criminal case does not control in order to meet the burden to move forward malicious prosecution. And those are the words and what actually plays out in reference to what happens on the record, why the case is dismissed. I'll let you, Ed, go in and, and articulate well, the details. Well, in this case, um, uh, Larry Thompson uh, lives in Brooklyn, and he was uh, living with his then fiance, um, and they had a baby. They had an infant. And apparently uh, the sister-in-law was living with them. Sister-in-law calls, uh, calls 911, and says that she believes that the baby is being abused by the father. EMS shows up. They say, hey, listen, we were called. 
Brother Larry Thompson says, I don't know what you're talking about. You got the wrong house. They leave. They contact the police. The police get to Larry Thompson's home. Larry Thompson says, I don't know what you're talking about. And do you have a warrant? If you don't have a warrant, then you can't come in. What do the cops do? The cops arrest Larry. They lock him up for two days. They take the baby to a hospital. The baby gets examined. What they find out is that the baby has a diaper rash. Now, keep in mind, the court mentions that Larry didn't even know that the sister-in-law who was mentally ill, we just talked about the mentally ill, right? She apparently calls and doesn't tell Larry that she's called uh, EMS and the authorities about this, all right? And she damn sure don't tell EMS and the authorities that she's mentally ill, right? So right, right. Right, right. So, so now, um, you know, Larry gets to court, gets the, the, gets to court. They eventually drop the charges and they don't say why. I, there's, there is mention of them making him an offer because normally they make your, your, your client an offer that, you know, they tell the, your client, oh, you know, just accept this. And that's what Royce is talking about in terms of ACD. And then it won't be on your record and it'll get dismissed and all that. But Larry said, no, 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 I didn't do anything wrong. We're going we're gonna to pursue this all the way. Eventually the charges get dropped, but they don't give a reason for why the charges get dropped. So then when Larry Thompson files his 1983 claim, his 42 USC 1983 claim under the Fourth Amendment claiming malicious prosecution, he has to now uh, deal with a certain evidentiary burden, right? The, you know, the the because the, normally what ends up happening is, is that the city then tries to get the case dismissed. And they say, oh, you're not meeting the burden. And the burden here, as, as, as Royce mentioned earlier, and I just want to be a little more clear about it, is you have to show a favorable determination of the underlying criminal prosecution. In other words, under the current Second Circuit precedent, I, I think I, I, I mentioned to the uh, audience in, in a show many shows ago, that the court of the federal court of appeals for our area is the second circuit, right? The second circuit of appeals. You have the trial court and then you have the court of appeals. And so ours is the second circuit. And in the second circuit, you have to show that the criminal prosecution ended not merely without a conviction, but also with some affirmative indication of innocence. Now, how is Larry Thompson supposed to show that when he doesn't even get a reason for why the case was dropped, dismissed. Well, not only that, how does Larry get a chance to show that when he doesn't control the language yeah. that used by the prosecutor and he's standing with his attorney and what he's asking the judge, which he should, and I've and I've done this, judge, what is the basis for the dismissal? A lot of attorneys don't do that. A lot of attorneys are not interested in the client then suing civilly or is not aware that that is going to happen or the client himself, the defendant himself at that time is not aware of what they need to be able to pursue that. Right. And so that's why you have some attorneys like myself and like, Ed, we'll take the criminal case and we'll take the civil rights case because we know what we need to have in order to move forward. So the DA's office never says we're dismissing the case because we can't meet our burden. Right. And so that that speaks volumes. You can't meet your burden. That means you can't prove that I'm guilty. If you can't prove I'm guilty, then something is wrong here. Or we are dismissing the case because statutorily we have nobody that will come and testify on our behalf to substantiate this crime. In New York is a 3030 speedy trial statute that says you have 90 days to try this case. You have 180 days to try felony cases. And so the DA's office never says, look, this is why we can't go forward. And so how are you able to get that favorable disposition where it's articulated the way that Ed has stated so you can move forward with malicious prosecution? It's impossible. It's not going to happen. So so the court held that to demonstrate a favorable termination of a criminal prosecution for purposes of the Fourth Amendment claim under 1983 for, for malicious prosecution, a plaintiff need not show that the criminal prosecution ended with some affirmative indication of innocence. A plaintiff need only show that his prosecution ended without a conviction. 
So that's to satisfy that requirement here. That's big. Now, that's not to say that he still doesn't have other hurdles in this case. Because the, the you know the, the the city is gonna argue that well the the officers had probable cause or that they are insul you know they're 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 insulated under qualified immunity because you know there wasn't a clearly established law that they violated here. You know, they're gonna argue, oh, we we got this call about this baby and we did what we thought was 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 necessary. But nonetheless, it's important. This is a very Important. Well, I mean, look, look, and putting what you said in perspective, right? Qualified immunity is a defense that is used when you're on trial. If you don't meet the standard for which the Supreme Court has just articulated in reference to malicious prosecution, you don't even go to trial. So exactly. this court, this decision stands on its own. We could talk about all the defenses in the world, but this Supreme Court decision is important because it gets me to first base. Once I'm on first base, now, now we're playing baseball. When you at home plate, you ain't playing baseball. When you get on base, now you're playing baseball because now a decision has to be made. Hey, do we want to move forward with this case? That means the government, federal government, having to defend this case and possibly lose and not know what the damages are going to be. Or do we want to resolve this by way of settlement and some other resolution this way, all parties leave a little disgruntled because you can't take back the time that that was taken from the from the plaintiff slash defendant. But he's compensated monetarily, and that is a big hurdle because now you're out the gate, and that means your story is able to be told to a jury, and that's important. And you get to call balls and strikes. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, you know this is. It's interesting for the general public to kind of understand how this case came to be. And kudos to Larry Thompson and his attorneys for getting it all the way to Supreme Court. Because, you know, oh, yes. we know this not the first time that something like this has happened, but he clearly had the wherewithal to have legal counsel that helped him advocate for his rights and to get it all the way up to Supreme Court. And what is also important. Um, and looking at what we just discussed is that that incident that that Larry was 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 involved in that the plaintiff was involved in that's just a simple that's nothing extravagant it's nothing that you know that is not uncommon it is a very simple situation it is like the guy who has a trespassing case who's like I'm not trespassing but the police don't have time to hear you to listen to you. We're going to do what we're going to do because we can do what we can do. And that's important. Like, this wasn't no hurricane case with all these facts. This is everyday stuff. And like you said, Dr. Grant, everyday stuff like this sometimes don't make it to the Supreme Court. Nope. Right? Because it's, it's, it's small. It's not big. The issue is not heavy. But this is a heavy Fourth Amendment issue that we could ride out in the sunset. Having cases like this, dealing with cases like this, on a daily basis. And just so you, just to make it clear, um, the usual suspects dissented on this case, Justice Alito, our good friend and family member, uh, Clarence Thomas, dissented on this one. Your cousin. Yep. As well as Neil Gorsuch. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? It's that so needed a... <laughs> You know, your peoples, your peoples, your peoples. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you for letting us know uh, who dissented. Not that we're shocked, uh, but interesting. And as we, we close out the last five minutes of the show, uh, since we did have a little uh, levity there, this unfortunately is a very sad situation that continues to unfold. We're not getting into all the debates and critiques that everyone is making. I just really want to talk to the two of you about legally there are <clears throat> some alleged investigations going on. Uh, what can or can't happen at this point? Because Chris didn't press charges, but uh, apparently the Academy is looking into some sanctions and some other folks are suggesting. And Chris Rock's brother <clears throat> wants his Oscar revoked. Well, the, the Rocks in general... You know, because there's multiple rocks. Don't think that it's just one rock. I mean, there's pebbles all around this place right here. I think he got like 10 brothers. You Not know pebbles, saying? rocks. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're out here in these streets. You know what I mean? The good thing for the good thing for Will is where he lives. They're not they're not walking that block. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know because you know, they're they're out here and they're about. And Tony's just one of them. I mean, the sanctions. You know, the they're gonna do what they're gonna do. There's really you know the Oscars. There's really nothing heavy that I can really speak to in, in reference to how those folks, them people, deal with that entity of the Oscars and maybe we have another show on what's that's all about in reference to running around with this gold trophy, this, this, you know, what that means anyway. Um, but from a, as we mentioned before, from a, from a criminal standpoint, you know, the DA can do what it wants to do because it has, you know, they has, they have the footage and they can proceed if they want to. Uh, they have decided not to. And, and Chris can still be on the sidelines while they do what they want to do. Um, private entities can act as they want, sanction, or what have you. A matter of fact, um, is even it even brought up um, something that Ed has talked about. You know, people how people see us. We're the aggressor. We're more aggressive. We're more macho. And I heard that bantered about in idle conversation, just doing a little ear hustle. How people are gravitating to that. You know, from a cultural perspective. Yeah, it's I unfortunate. Mean, I mean, listen, um, you know, I, as I stated, I think at the end of the last show, um, there's still a prospect for, you know, a civil suit here. Maybe Chris is saying maybe his people are contemplating a possible uh, civil suit and he's looking to see what the Academy does. Um, from what I understand, was it, I guess, either early this week or last week, um, Will, Will Smith uh, resigned from the Motion Picture Academy. Uh, he did. You know, which means that you know he no longer has a vote because apparently he was on the Motion Picture Academy and had a had a vote that those members have in terms of you know uh, these awards and their- I don't know if that's all altruism or is that just preventive mitigation right it's coming your way so let me jump in front of it before it comes my way yeah I'm, I'm seeing an increasing number of uh, apologetic statements coming out of that camp um, you know you're. As you stated, I'm pretty sure a lot of mitigation factors, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, the the the, the DA can act; they're just choosing uh, not to. Um, and I think I heard, uh, I actually saw a clip of the brother doing a, a recent show saying, "Anybody who thinks they're going to walk up on this stage is going to get these hands." I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, so, it's, yeah, it's gotten. When well, you talk about where the legal meets the cultural, culturally, <laughs> yeah, culturally, yeah, we yeah, have gone. Yeah. Way over the line. Yeah, I just, you know, I just hope, I just hope people, I hope people can back up what they're saying because you up there on that stage popping that, and your hands better be what you say they are. Well, I'm, you know, you. Well, I mean, I'm just, just, I'm just not advocating any violence. I'm not yeah, advocating. Yeah, yeah. Any I mean, listen, there was a uh, there people was a rap about incident. what they don't live, and people talk about what they don't do. You know, I mean, I saw, I saw some recent incident where Mike Tyson was attending an actual comedy show, and some man was trying to provoke him and actually come to find out he had a weapon on him and had to, and you know, cool as a fan, Mike Tyson was just like, listen, you know, he just was looking at the guy and eventually hugged him and the guy left without any violence taking place. Let but, me tell you, that guy would have never gotten to that weapon once. I mean, like, like <laughs> unless Mike, unless Mike alerted him saying, yo, I'm going to hit you right now, which <laughs> guys from Brooklyn don't do. And we just don't do that when you're fighting. And the guy would have never been able to get, like, I'm not telegraphing it. I'm not sending you an email, a text message, or any other social media that you get ready to get bopped inside your head. It just happens. That's how it goes. Well, I, I, I think oh, Mick Tyson, his history and where he comes from, he, I think he knew deep down inside this guy was bluffing, and he gave him the look, and the guy understood, okay, listen, you know, this is what it out. is. Yeah, well, and, I, and, and that's, you know, and I, and I hope, you know, that that is what, you know, I, I just... I just really, really am hoping that none, nothing, nothing comes of this crazy. Right. We, we don't need in, to make some violence. Yeah, a bad situation worse. You know, yeah, it wasn't right. the best thinking mm -hmm. in that moment. He uh, clearly has apologized in his way. Uh, you know, there's always more to the story. Like, what led you in that moment to have a temporary break with reality? Um, and, um, and, and, something so publicly. And and Whoopi Goldberg is on the actual board board of the. And she seems to be indicating that they're not looking to take the award. Because I think there are others who have been saying yeah, but the award hasn't been 
actually taken that have that have actually won. I think there's a certain standard that they don't want to break in terms of as egregious as the conduct may be. That's one thing that we don't do. I think Roman Polanski, I think maybe Harvey Weinstein and some Look, others. One, one box players. opens up another box, right? And so the best way not to have anybody saying that they're disparity in any shape, form, or fashion is to not open it because you best to believe that if they took it from him, there would be a group out here protesting why you treated him differently, notwithstanding the facts that led to it. Mm-hmm. Wow. So uh, to be continued, as I love to say when things are unfolding, because this is news that will not replace everyone's headlines until something else happens. But, you know, I do just offer concern and empathy for both sides. You know, it's a very unfortunate situation, but I appreciate those celebrities who didn't jump to criticism, but work towards empathy and helping uh, to solve the optics uh, best that they could. And, you know, as I close, it was interesting. I saw something pop up on my feed that his wife now is saying, well, he overreacted. I don't know if that really happened or not. See, I'm this, like, wait, what? This, let me just, this is my salutation for the day right here. Silence is a safe place. True. That's a good one. All right. We'll see you next week. 